in your, in your hearing, Matthew chapter 14, we'll begin at verse number one. Hey man, what a sweet presence of the Lord in this place. Woo. We could easily just shift and just laying out and, and just letting God do the whole thing. But some of y'all think I ought to work for my pay. What's sad is you don't pay me. So I'll work anyway. In Jesus' name. Man, I'm so glad to see my friends. I'm going to get y'all. But don't you leave before I get you after service, all right? Amen. Amen. At that time, Herod, the tetrarch, heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore the promised, therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. That's a cold-blooded person. Huh? Can you imagine if you offended somebody today and they said, what do you want? Go cut his head off and bring it to me. Holy mackerel. <laughs> okay, y'all, okay, maybe that doesn't get some of you. Some of you don't feel it. Bring me his head on a platter and the king was sorry, nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. If you'll set your Bibles down or media devices, whatever it is, and let's get in tune right now with the word. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is awesome. It's powerful. God, your word can do it all. Your anointing is in this place already. Your presence is resting upon us. I ask for the next little while, God, that you continue to do your thing in the hearts of everyone in this room and watching by video. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. This is a text that has many directions, actually. John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a preacher that stomped in on the scene. He came preaching. That's what he did. If you think preachers aren't necessary, see me after church and we'll have a Bible study. I feel like getting wild this morning. But he came preaching. He preached as if he wouldn't have tomorrow or you wouldn't have tomorrow. We called it, he preached like there was no tomorrow. John the Baptist was a preacher. His message could really be reduced to one single word that we do not like in the 21st century church, repent. Tell them I said hello, please. <laughs> Praise God. Put them on speaker, we'll all say hello. In Jesus' name. <laughs> I know, you notice, just look around, you'll see the red-faced person. <laughs> it's always one that's blood red trying to duck. I don't know who it was, but I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> but you could sum it up in a single word, repent. We don't like that word here in America. Repent from what? I don't like you to tell me I'm doing wrong. He said repent. He told the affluent, repent. He told the down and out to repent. He told the up and coming, repent. Repent. He told sinners, repent. He even told religious folk, repent. Repent. John the Baptist came preaching, repent. Or in the infamous terms of Pastor Braden, wherever he's at, there he comes with his colorful busy shirt. Turn or burn, repent or perish. 
That's what he's known for. If you don't know him, that's what he did. He did it since he was in Concordia and him and Nick. Let's move on. T.O.B., Turner Burn. That's what John the Baptist preached. He preached repentance. He was the voice in the wilderness. He was the one who called for crooked paths to be made straight. He preached until country people came and repented. He preached until city urban folks came and repented. He kept on preaching. He, did, he didn't do a single miracle, but what he did do is preach repentance. King Herod heard him preach. King Herod didn't like the message. John the Baptist gave him the same treatment as he gave everyone else. The preacher pointed his finger at the king and he said, repent. Knowing that his very life was at stake, he said, repent. Ooh, Lord, y'all think y'all know what I'm gonna do. We'll see. He said, repent, king. John the Baptist was a man of tremendous character, heartfelt passion, boundless zeal for God but he couldn't pierce the heart of Herod. Our text says that Herod would have killed the preacher immediately, but Herod was afraid of what would happen to him because his hatred for John the Baptist did not supersede his fear of what would happen to him. <laughs> Finally, he did silence the voice of John, but he couldn't stop the world's greatest preacher we read later that when Herod heard of Jesus he thought John the Baptist had come back to life the Bible says that the king was sorry the greatest preacher can't be silenced he never sleeps he never slumbers no one has found fault with the voice or the quality of the voice of the greatest preacher. He has no weakness in delivery, no frailties to overcome. He always speaks truth with reason. Each of us has heard him preach countless times, but his ministry spans all of human history. At this moment, as I speak, earth's greatest preacher will deliver his soul to Canada and China and Mexico City and Johannesburg, South Africa, He's preaching even now as I speak. He will preach on the seven seas and across all seven continents. He's preaching now. Amen. If men were on Mars today and not on a space station or in a space vessel, Earth's greatest pe preacher would become Mars greatest preacher or the moon's greatest preacher. For wherever man is, Earth's greatest preacher goes. Amen. The first human heard him preach before the altar call was over, he was looking for something to wear. The first killer in scripture heard this preacher. Abel's voice didn't impact Cain, but when earth's greatest preacher spoke, Cain began to weep. The punishment is more than I can bear. A king named David shook and cried when that preacher came and said, you are the man. Judas wilted under the message of this preacher. And rather than continue to listen or hear the voice, the betrayer of innocent blood raced off and killed himself. Years ago, you might remember if you're old enough, you'd have to be at least mid-40s or older, or you've read it in a history book then. There was a serial killer named Ted Bundy. Does anybody remember him? He looked absolutely normal, like some of you. I hope you're not that dude. <laughs> Might have messed the whole message up right there. <laughs> Ted Bundy was a serial killer. And Ted Bundy testified of fearing this one preacher more than even the electric chair. I'm sure... All of you sitting here right now have figured it out or you're, you're at least wondering the one that I'm speaking of and who this preacher is that has such power. But Paul describes this preacher in Romans chapter 2 when it reads this in, in verse 14, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else accusing them. 
Their conscience bore witness. Their conscience is bearing witness. A person's conscience is the most powerful speaker and pers persistent preacher in your life. Is your conscience. You can't escape it. It's hard to get away from it. <laughs> Let me interject here. A lot of people get mad what they hear me speak from my mouth here when it's your conscience that's eating you up. It's your conscience that's making the altar call. It's your conscience that's drawing you in. It's your conscience that tells you, I've got to do this or I've got to do that. But you look at all the flamboyance of the guy wearing the beautiful shirt and make that judgment. It's him. The conscience. The conscience. There's a lot of fire alarms and we've got all these things around here that have sensors. I don't understand it all, but they have these internet things installed now. I don't know where they're all. There's one back there. I see it. Everybody's like, where? Where? Yeah, we're filming you. But there's a lot of, there's many electronic fire alarms that have these internal switches that are triggered by beams, beams of light. And they're, they're triggered in that way. But as long as the beam of light is received unbroken, the detector will stay quiet. As long as you don't mess with that thing, it'll stay quiet. But if smoke or moisture or whatever it does or insects or whatever that would obstruct that beam, the alarm goes off instantly. And it sounds. Our conscience resembles such an alarm. Our conscience has spoken to us in dark places. Our conscience has spoken to us in bright places. Our conscience speaks to us even now. This morning your conscience was speaking to you. While we were singing these songs and the Spirit of the Lord was moving in, your conscience was doing an altar call. Oh, Lord Jesus. I'm going to have fun in a minute. Somebody, did you spray this thing with something? That thing smells like Febreze. Mental note, don't let my wife get a hold of your hanky. It's got chemicals on it. I just tasted it. <laughs> Our conscience is the alarm that goes off Frequently. Can anybody testify? Amen. Amen. Come on. Two of you. We'll see. Come on. When something obstructs its connection with the light of God's spirit, the conscience signals us at that, at that moment and says there's something life-threatening. There's a danger that's coming. That's what drove Adam and Eve into hiding. That's what drove Simon Peter to a place of repentance. Unfortunately, as we already know, it drove Judas to a place of remorse. The voice of conscience is the greatest preacher we could ever experience. The Apostle Paul argued that the truth of God and the grace of God are revealed in that our consciences will teach us right and wrong if we would just listen. During the next little bit, as you hear my voice, you're hearing another voice even as I talk. You resist that voice. Have you ever resisted your conscience? It tells you don't do that, and you do it anyway. Some of you are addicted to substances, and your conscience is constantly telling you it's not good for you. Don't do that. It's not me saying it, but you get mad at me because I'll repeat it up here, but it's your conscience that tells you don't go there, and you'll cuss the preacher. Oh, you know I got your number this morning. The second voice is earth's greatest preacher speaking with you. You'll hear this, this other voice talking and it's preaching. He'll remind you that God has a claim on your life and you can never escape such claim. You can never escape the claim that he has on you. He created you for him, for his good pleasure. That's why you can run and be in turmoil you can serve and be at peace but run and be in turmoil because God designed you for his great pleasure. You can't shut off the voice of your conscience. You wish you could. At night when you lay there, it keeps talking incessantly like my youngest daughter. <laughs> it never shuts up. Please, God. I got at least three grandkids that need muzzles. <laughs> They don't ever quit talking. 
Y'all are laughing because y'all know somebody in your family. Maybe it's you. <laughs> you can't shut off the voice of your conscience. This preacher finds you wherever you're at. No matter where you go, it's there. But the conscience has a greatness. That's the first quality that makes conscience earth's best preacher. The voice of your conscience locates you no matter where you're at, no matter where you go, no matter how high you are, how low you've descended to. Your conscience keeps speaking. You may get away from my voice. You may tune me out even now, but you cannot escape the voice of your conscience. Many have said they're tired and weary of being convicted when they come to church. So they'll run and find another church. <laughs> another church that says, hey, we don't need your commitment. We just want your dollar. Another church that asks for no commitment and they give the same in return. But when you see them, the next time you see that person that hopped away, they're no happier than they were before. They're no committed than they were before. They're, more on, they're no more on fire than they were before. In fact, because you can't escape this preacher, usually when you see these people, their faces will be the perfect portrait of misery. Why, preacher, is that? Why does this happen? Because they can escape me as a human preacher. They can escape another human preacher, but they cannot get away from their own conscience. There's a story that's been told many times of a man that consulted his doctor and he said, hey, doc, I've been bad. I've been misbehaving and my conscience won't shut up. It keeps troubling me. Have y'all ever been there? Maybe I'm talking to myself. Maybe this is what I need to look in the mirror. And it just keeps troubling me. I can't silence it. So, doc, I need your help. So the doctor says, well, do you want something that will strengthen your willpower? Well, no, I don't want that. I was thinking of something that would weaken my conscience. Unfortunately, a weak conscience is anything but quiet. A weak conscience is not silent. The Bible teaches that a weak conscience can be more troubling than a good conscience. If you'll read 1 Corinthians 8, you'll learn that. You can't wear, you can't wear this preacher out or rather you can wear me out because I get weary. I get tired. When I get home on Sundays, there's many times, depending on the flow of the Spirit and how it's going, and because there's so much prep that goes into what we do on a day in and day out basis in a pulpit and in a church service, you see 45 minutes, we usually see days. When I get home, many times, it's everything I can do. My wife will concur just to get into the house and collapse into my recliner. If you don't understand the spiritual tug that I'm talking about, you don't have to today. That's not my point. Because I get tired as a human. My voice gets tired. But the voice of, my, of your conscience never wearies. Conscience doesn't need any rest. His messages keep on coming day after day, hour after hour, week after week, month after month. He keeps preaching. The conscience, conscience keeps on preaching. Conscience is like the fabled wolverine who tracks its prey. You can't escape him. You can't get away from his message. He follows you into the church. He follows you outside the church. Everywhere you go, he seems to be there. I'll be in my office and my conscience keeps talking. See, y'all know I'm a bad person because my conscience never shuts up. But I can go to my office and my conscience will be there. I can go out in my shop or my garage and my conscience is there. I don't think the dripping, the nagging wife dripping faucet thing in Proverbs was real. I think it was the conscience. And then God let us marry another voice. No, let me hear Move on. But it just keeps on no matter where I go. If I'm out in the field, if I'm out in my tractor, no matter what I'm doing, it follows me there. He sets up a pulpit in the belly of a whale under sea, if need be. Conscience is indefatigable. Conscience 
never wears out. He keeps on preaching and preaching and preaching. 24-7, 365 preaching. Normally he doesn't get an offering. He just keeps preaching. He has a way of hounding sinners and reminding them of their mistakes and hounding Christians every time they make a mistake. Joseph was a dreamer, his father's favorite. He was a wise orator, but Joseph, or Joseph became powerful. He was second, the Bible tells us, only to Pharaoh. But Joseph was powerless to reach his own brothers. His bright, shining dreams didn't reach them. His crying from the pits that they threw him in didn't reach him, or reach them, rather. His pitiful shouts while the Ishmaelites took him away didn't even budge them. Joseph may have given up, but 10 conscience preachers refused to give up. 20 years or so later, a passel of consciences were on the trail of his 10 brothers. As they stood before the strange governor of Egypt, the guilt proved overwhelming in the book of Genesis chapter number 42. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore his distress, this distress has come upon us and Reuben answered them saying, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy and you would not listen. Therefore behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them. For he spoke to them through an interpreter and he turned himself away from them and he wept. Joseph, earth's greatest preacher is doing the work, Joseph. I submit to you that conscience is the greatest preacher in all the earth because it is inescapable. You can't get away from it. The tireless, tenacious preacher just won't stop. It keeps preaching. He keeps going. He got King David in his sights and brought him to his knees. He preached and Simon Peter repented. We don't deal with an ordinary preacher when we deal with conscience. He can be seared, he can be violated, he can be outraged, he can be evaded, or but he cannot be evaded rather. Conscience just keeps on preaching. Why? Why would God allow such a thing within our hearts? How could he, being merciful, allow this messenger to be sent into our lives? Why did he do this? It's far better to endure the voice of your conscience than to suffer the ravages of hell for all eternity. For those who suffer in hell will not only suffer from darkness, they will not only suffer from the flames, they will not only suffer from poor company and despair, they will not only suffer from the absence of God, they will have to endure something else. Judas, you killed yourself, but you couldn't kill your conscience. It went with you. Because conscience, the preacher, is part of your eternal soul. The voice that endures. Your last hours on earth, you may hear the voice of your conscience. When you stand before judgment, the judgment bar and attempt to make excuses, conscience will rise up and tear your futile alibis to pieces. He will remind you before all of your evil thoughts and deeds. But conscience can go farther than judgment. Earth's greatest preacher set up his pulpit in the midst of the lake of fire and says things like this, son, remember? You sat there at your home and it always reminds you no matter how loud you turn the television or how much you get on your media devices, you can't turn it down. Mm. Do you remember? 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 Have you ever had that? Then conviction grows and you can't cover it up with alcohol. You can't cover it up with drugs. You can't cover it up with bad relationships. It just keeps on preaching. It keeps talking. I believe that's part of the real torment in hell. 
conscience endures beyond the grave. In 1937, maybe you were alive, maybe you weren't. There's this date on tombstones in New London, Texas. On that date, 1,200 students were in attendance in this only school in this boom town, this oil boom town. 20 minutes before class let out, the shop teacher flipped out or flipped off the electrical switch to the power saws and the spark went across the shop. The spark touched off an explosion that leveled the school building. 297 students and teachers were killed. They say, what caused the blast? The school board had earlier authorized a tap into a local natural gas pipeline, but sadly and unfortunately, the gas line was leaking and the gas had accumulated in all that dead space beneath the building and boom. The one positive effect of that disaster was a regulation that an odorant be added to natural gas. Anybody smelled the rotten egg smell? It's because of that one thing. The distinctive rotten egg smell of natural gas is an additive that warns you that there's a possible threat. Conscience does the same thing. The voice of conscience is a precursor or a harbinger, if you will, and an early warning of impending danger. If heeded, lives can be spared. If ignored, much harm can come. This is why Job said, I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. This is why Paul said, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God or man. I've given you two qualities. Pastor Nick, you can come warm up. Two qualities that show conscience in earth's greatest preacher. It will find you anywhere on earth. It will find you even beyond this earth. Even into the place of eternal torment. There's at least one more quality that makes conscience the greatest preacher. It's a voice that convinces. It's the one that convinces you to come when the tug of the Holy Spirit gets upon you because your will is stronger than God's will. Come on. Now some of the theologians in here are going to try to debate that one. Your human will is stronger. That's why your conscience is constantly preaching to you, pressing you. The only tyrant I accept in this world is still, is the still small voice within me. The only tyrant I accept in this world. That's what Gandhi said. In the Romans passage that I mentioned to you earlier, Paul said that the conscience either approves or excuses us. Paul argues that we come equipped with a good conscience that can know the difference between right and wrong. Over the years, a person can so disregard the conscience that a good conscience can become a bad one. Rather than reminding you of what is right, it tries to persuade you to do what is wrong. First Timothy, you would read in First Timothy 1.19, having, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. A good conscience will lead you to the crystal sea. A bad conscience will lead you to utter ruin. This is the problem with the advice, follow your conscience. For most people, following their conscience is like someone following a wheelbarrow, directing it wherever they want it to go. Disregarding your conscience and, over, and overriding it long enough and a good conscience capable of leading you in the right direction will become a bad conscience and will put you in the wrong direction. A bad conscience is still a good preacher, however. It will convince you that right is wrong and that wrong is right. And I can prove that to you because some of us, or if you look around our world today, churches 
have even embraced what God said he abhors and they've preached it as if it's right. They'll take a scripture out of historical context and out of context of the, what the writer intended and they'll try to make whatever it is that they're saying is right look right. Even though God said it was an abomination. It will persuade you that you can do what you want with no repercussions. Titus 1, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to, profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. A defiled or bad conscience keeps trying to convince you, keeps trying to tell you it's okay to do this, it's okay to do that. What does church mean? You can miss church, it's no big deal. The gathering place is not even necessary anymore. Don't worry about it. One of the biggest debates we have in Christendom today is that very thing. It's okay if you don't pray all the time. You don't have to be a Jesus freak. You don't have to always carry, come on, man. You don't have to always do that. Your conscience, it keeps telling you if it's a bad conscience, God knows you're really a good person. Don't worry about it. Good people do bad things. Don't sweat the small stuff. It will tell you don't worry about that. That means nothing. But my Bible lets us know that Woe to those that would call evil good and good evil. Woe to a bad conscience that seeks to convince people of evil. Woe to a bad conscience that causes people to believe a lie and be damned. The conscience is a great preacher, either good or bad. Don't check out, we're done. Pastor Nick, start banging on some keys, doing something back there. We must be like David. When we hear conscience preaching, repent. Amen. Don't argue. Repent. But no, repent. Well, no, repent. Immediately, if not sooner. When it steps in, and throws caution at you. Repent. No matter how dark it's become in your life, repent. No, no matter how much you've justified your actions, repent. I'm sick of, I'm going to use air quotes, y'all know I hate them. I'm sick of Christians making excuses for everything. Instead, you need to repent. We've preached about it for years. The world is looking for authenticity. But your own conscience as a Christian, you've justified your action. We gotta be like David. Repent. Repent early and often, and you'll experience true liberty. Forgive early and often, and you'll experience true liberty. Hold on to a grudge, and it'll be a diseased seed in your soul. We repent often, repent immediately, or you'll become like Balaam. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway, and we'll do it over and over again until it becomes normal in our lives, and your conscience becomes, goes from the good preacher to the bad preacher. And you can't distinguish it because you allowed it. And you justify everything. If you know me and you've talked to me individually and privately, you'll know if you come to justify your position with me of sin, of denial, of lack of fellowship, lack of accountability and rebellion, I'm going to chastise you because I love you. Herod, you're sorry. When John the Baptist couldn't reach you, your conscience stepped in. 
If something I'm saying today isn't reaching you specifically, your conscience has already spoken to you. I didn't even have to go this long. It's already spoken. So why don't you stand? When John the Baptist couldn't do it, when Pastor James couldn't do it, your conscience was still speaking. It was speaking before you got here today. You know what you got to do. You know what you have to do. Some decided I won't go to church today. Big deal. It's not important. Your conscience told you don't lay there. But then you get angry if somebody says, hey, man, we missed you at church. Well, you know, I don't have to be there every Sunday. Your conscience has been seared and violated. The good preacher is compromised. Because the same Bible says in the book of Hebrews, never forsake that gathering place, the assembling of the body. It's not just for you. It's for the strength of the community, man. But the bad conscience says, big deal. The good conscience keeps preaching. If you're not careful, you'll get bitter. You'll get mad. You can't hop away from this. You can hop away physically from here, but you can't hop away from what you heard because your conscience is going to remind you. And I'll be sitting at home smiling. Talk to them, conscience. Preach to them. Get on. I don't even have to say nothing. See, y'all know what I pray now. <laughs> Hallelujah. When John the Baptist couldn't do it, your conscience did. It's not too late. You can hear the voice. You can respond. You don't have to go that other road. You can respond now. My conscience. I've had people say, man, my conscience won't leave me alone. It's hurting. I don't rejoice that your conscience might stir you up and even hurt you, as you would say. But I do rejoice in the fact that that's a good sign because there's still hope for you. It means that your conscience hasn't lost its voice in your life. Your conscience still has a voice. Your conscience can still preach to you. It can still speak to you. It can still reach you. I believe that greatest preacher is in the room. And it's certainly not this one. It's the one that God, God put in your internal soul. Amen. You, can, you can argue with me. You can be wrong. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to let you know that when I'm not around or your wife's not around, your husband's not around, your friends aren't around, nobody's around, who's talking to you? We call it a still small voice. It's God put a conscience in your soul. so you don't crash and burn. You see people crash and burn all the time. It's because they rejected the preacher. Not the one on TV. Not the one here. The, the one God. Come on, some of you older folks, y'all ought to be amening because the only reason you ain't that dead and in hell is because that conscience broke through you. I hear it now. We're going to open the altar. We'll pray with you. I believe it's preaching now. Preach God. Preach God. Don't resist it. Don't make excuses. It doesn't matter how far you went. It doesn't matter how much you know. I don't care how Pentecostal you are, how Baptist you are, wherever you came. It doesn't even matter to me. I want more of Jesus. Submit yourself to the preached word of God. Submit yourself to the conscience that's been tugging on you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You better cry out. This isn't the time to play, y'all. Look at the world. In Jesus' name. This altar is open. I'd like to pray with you. If you want to submit your life wholly and completely to Jesus. If you want a fresh start. If you want a fresh anointing. If you want to just be a stronger believer. Won't you run down here? Run down here. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, some of you that are dragging, come on. 
Let's do this together. Let's do this together. My conscience.